So I'd like to go ahead and get started with our program. Again, I want to welcome you to the Alden Kindred's presentation of Cape Cod's oldest shipwreck, the Desperate Crossing of the Sparrowhawk. My name is Desiree Mobed and I am the Executive Director. The Alden Kindred preserves and shares the legacy of Mayflower passengers John and Priscilla Alden at their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts. Um, they do this through guided tours, educational programs like this, exhibitions, um, and genealogical research. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our members who are joining us today and whose support helps make programs like this possible. Also to Massachusetts Humanities, which funded this talk through their Bridge Street grant program. On this beautiful fall day in New England, we are very delighted to welcome author and historian Mark Wilkins, who will help us delve into the secrets of the 17th century vessel named the Sparrowhawk that wrecked off Cape Cod after a very difficult winter crossing, reemerged from the sands of the Cape during the Civil War, and recent discoveries that continue to fascinate us today. Mark is currently the curator of maritime history at the Calvert Marine Museum in Maryland. He's been director and curator of both Cape Cod Maritime Museum and the Atwood House Museum in Chatham, Massachusetts. He's worked for the Smithsonian and Myst at Mystic Seaport. He's the published author of books and articles related to maritime and aviation history. He has a master's degree from Harvard University and is currently working on several books related to World War I aviation. After Mark's talk, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question and answer function on your screen. If you have to leave early or would like to share this program with others, uh, we will be recording it and it will be posted on the Alden website. And now we'd like to go ahead and welcome Mark Wilkins. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Desiree. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I'm certainly delighted to talk about Sparrowhawk, uh, which is a, a long-standing passion of mine and uh, uh, just a fascinating topic that uh, is really en en enigmatic. Uh, the, uh, we'll get into that. But um, so my fascination, let me, let me just give you kind of some context. My fascination with this artifact began many, many, many years ago. Um, I visited the artifact at Pilgrim Hall Museum. I was visiting my colleague and friend, Steve O'Neill, who was a curator at the time at um, Pilgrim Hall Museum. And I saw this thing and I was like, oh my goodness. I said, this looks like a dinosaur. I just couldn't stop staring at it. I was, I was mesmerized by this, um, this strange artifact. And of course, being a maritime historian and a boat builder and all of the sailor, all of that, I was just fascinated by the shape of the vessel and the way the timbers were fitted together. And I just couldn't stop looking at it. So that began my, my fascination, my obsession, <laughs> you might even call it with the artifact and with its story, which um, is difficult to, uh, it's difficult to piece it together because um, there's, there's not much that we actually know uh, other than a few primary sources about it, okay? So I'll, I'll just um, jump into it. This talk is based on a small book I wrote in 2011 while I was working on my thesis on grad school. And Sparrowhawk became actually a very, important part of my thesis uh, at Harvard, uh, which talks about um, English shipbuilding um, for about three centuries worth. So um, anyway, uh, this became a very good case study for uh, the evolution of uh, English shipbuilding. So, um, you know, let's sort of set the stage. Uh, you know, what, what's this about? This small little boat goes across in winter and runs out of supplies and food and gets, gets lost and, and wrecks off the outer coast of Cape Cod, you know, what were they thinking, <laughs> right? Were they crazy? Were they, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, habitual drunkards? Um, who knows? But so to unpack that story, we have to really examine the context, okay? Talk about the context in which this voyage was made and uh, sort of the events leading up to, um, you know, these small vessels coming across. Interestingly, too, 
We think of large vessels like Mayflower or Susan Constant um, or the Ark down here in Maryland uh, coming across these large vessels um, during the Great Migration, but port books tend to support the conclusion that most of the vessels coming across were small vessels like Sparrowhawk. And you have to wonder, knowing the nature of the North Atlantic, especially in wintertime, again, what were they thinking? So we'll get to that, okay? I'm gonna uh, begin by talking as the talk, um, this lovely photograph in the back of this uh, first pane, I will get to that too, that's on Boston Common. And that's one of my favorite pictures of the artifact. Anyway, so European expansionism, it sounds like a daunting subject and it is. Um, England, uh, yeah, her Atlantic, you know, England became the preeminent uh, maritime power uh, by 1805 Trafalgar. But prior to that, she really was much, um, much on the periphery. She wasn't at the center. She wasn't a hub of mercantilism or trade or power that she would eventually become. So during the 16th century, the 1500s, her, she looked with jealous eyes towards Spain and her desire at that point was to break into existing Spanish trade networks. Uh, the Spanish uh, fleet, silver and gold fleet coming from the West Indies up to Spain made Spain rich. And England wanted a, a piece of that. Okay. The other thing they wanted to find was this fabled attempt to find a shortcut to the, um, the Orient, right? The Silk Road, which brought spices and silks and, and various high uh, value, low volume commodities from China, from the Far East over the overland um, was a real, you know, by the time it finally got to Europe, uh, the prices were exorbitant. So everybody was fixated on trying to find a shortcut to get to the Far East, um, this Northwest Passage quickly, so they could go directly and you know cut out the middleman <laughs> and get these things directly. Um, part of the allure of the Americas was the impression that the Pacific was just over the mountains of Virginia, okay? Again, a lot of kind of flawed assumptions that they were operating on in terms of um, you know, getting out into the Atlantic and, and becoming part of, of that experience. Again, Spain was a, was a huge driving force, okay? So England really did, couldn't, couldn't hack it. They, they failed to really break into the Spanish trade networks in the way they wanted to in the Caribbean. Uh, couldn't find the North, Northwest Passage. So England makes her Atlantic debut by piracy, right? Um, you know, state-sanctioned piracy, basically. Francis Drake was one of many such legalized pirates. And this is kind of what, what, what kind of came to pass. Uh, we can't we can't do this legitimately, so we're gonna we're gonna do it by privateering letter of mark, uh, as I mentioned, state sanctioned piracy. Go out there and get the stuff that way. Okay, um, you know, many such stories. John Hawkins, Elizabeth the first, sort of unofficial uh, pirate, uh, slave trader, all kinds of things uh, happen. And actually, incidentally, the first American colony was the lost colony of Roanoke in 1585. This was um, I believe Sir Walter Raleigh's base of operations. For privateering, it was um, it was far enough away from the silver gold train so that it wouldn't risk reprisals. Was close enough to be within striking distance. Okay, so um, that's the, th the famous lost colony. We don't really know what happened to it. There are many theories about what happened to it: disease, uh, massacre by native peoples, etc. There's just no way to know. Okay, so yeah, um, Tudor preoccupation with Spain, Elizabeth. A wonderful painting of Elizabeth, one of my favorite uh, pictures of her. Uh, during her reign, um, uh, expeditions to the New World, they weren't really convinced that it was um, a viable thing yet because uh, the, 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 the privateering base was giving them some money, but again, the, the search for these commodities, and we'll get to that in a minute about why that was so important, um, really wasn't proof that there was anything there that uh, that uh, was going to be uh, lucrative, okay? Um, but that being said, uh, the Crown did uh, give charter grants and ships, um, but most of the funding was up to the private joint stock merchant coalitions. This is the type of thing that Sparrowhawk was, right? We'll get to the definition of that in a little bit, but um, basically a bunch of guys get together and say, we'll pool our money, we'll, we'll hire a ship and a captain and buy some supplies, and we will lure... Uh, indentured servants, mainly Irish uh, Irish people, 
um, over to the new world with the promise of fortunes and, and, and all of this land, something that was in, in short order in England. So also Elizabeth is fixated on the threat posed by the Spanish Armada. The, everyone knew, you know, there was this elemental battle between Catholicism and, and you know, uh, uh, England wanted to be free of it for, for many reasons. Of course, Henry VIII, under his reign, uh, he wanted to be able to <laughs> divorce his wife. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Um, but anyway, um, there's elemental uh, sort of uh, uh, antagonism between Spain and England. And they knew the Armada was massing, they knew it was coming. Um, and England worried about it, or especially Elizabeth worried about it all the time. Um, this, this wonderful painting shows the Armada battle in the left and the Spanish Armada wrecked on the Irish coast on the right. So it's this wonderful thing. And there's Elizabeth with her hand on the globe. These ideas of nascent imperialism and uh, colonialism that uh, you know make the world England, right? This was this was nascent notions of this uh, during her expansion out into the Atlantic. All right. So seeds of colonization. So yeah, I mean, how did they come up with these ideas of these uh, colonies at Jamestown and at Plymouth? Well, England cut her colonial teeth on plantation projects in Ireland. Um, and much of the ide ideologies concerning colonization were formed here. Although, yeah, there were very important differences. Um, also, Ireland was, the, Ireland was the back door to invasion. So having um, colonies in Ireland kind of kept, you know, England's eye on that Irish coast, right? Um, so Royal Navy was kept close to home uh, while the privateers waged unofficial war on Spanish seafaring. So uh, they wanted to keep the Navy close in because they knew the Armada was coming, but they still wanted some of that gold and silver that was coming back to Spain, all right? And also during this time, we don't have much time to get into this, but the Royal Navy was being overhauled and redesigned and rebuilt to make much more um, efficient, weatherly, stable uh, gun platforms. That's what actually spelled the defeat uh, for, for the Spanish was, was the uh, uh, fixation on the race-built galleon and cannon, which the Spanish tactics were still um, the old style, which were grappling board. In other words, you've got a vessel full of soldiers with grappling hooks and they're gonna, they're gonna grapple onto your boat jump on board your boat, overrun you, and take your vessel. And that's, that's, that was the Spanish view of, a, of an engagement. The English had, had changed their tactics and um, uh, basically adopted a, a policy of standoff and shoot. So we don't have to get close to the vessel anymore. We've got these wonderful cannons. We'll just stand off several hundred yards and blow them to kingdom come. And that's, that's what kind of turned the tide at the, uh, at the Armada clash in 1588. Anyway, um, getting off topic here. <laughs> so um, she said, Elizabeth sets up, she basically establishes this state-funded piracy, establishes these colonial projects in um, Ireland, the Munster and Ulster plantations, which Ireland just loved, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious here. The last thing they wanted is the, the English telling them how to uh, run their lives and what, to, what, to, what religion to pray to. So after Elizabeth's death in 1603, James I of England and James IV of Scotland ends the war with Spain because the crown is bankrupt from fighting this war. Okay, so um, he tries to unite England and Scotland. Um, oh, I'm sorry, he began the, the Munster and Ulster plantations. I got ahead of myself, as well as Jamestown, so named for him. Um, this did offer a promise of new markets and a bastion of Protestantism, okay? And again, this, this, uh, this recurring theme, the shortcut to the Pacific was also envisaged um, at, you know, at this time, the Northwest Passage. And what's important too is England thought of colonization um, as a directly westward endeavor. So if you take England and go directly west, there's America, that's what they thought of rather than going north or south. And we adopted this, we inherited this, our own uh, expansionism. Uh, we didn't go into, think of going into Canada or Mexico, we went directly westward. We inherited that, that, that ethos of, of this westward, ever, ever west, right? So we talked about new commodities. Why are they important? Well, by 1604, the woolen trade, which was England's chief export, was clearly depressed, okay? Um, prices were down due to competition and other factors. So England needed new markets and new commodities. Um, they didn't know what they were. They thought of the obvious solutions, gold, silver, um, the, the shortcuts, anything that they could sell 
Um, you know, these are all things that they were interested in. And these are what, what sort of propelled these joint stock co coalitions out into the Atlantic was this assumption that they would find something that they could sell back in England to reinfuse the economy. Yeah, so <laughs> James first kind of funny. He, he came from Scotland, which has been historically uh, a poor country. And when he got to England, he thought, wow, this is great. I've got this wonderful castle, <laughs> royal finance and exchequer. And he thought, I'm rich. But then he really looked at what was going on and said, oh, wow, we're, we're actually broke from fighting this war with Spain. So we need to stop it. And that's what he did. OK, so. So we're, we're getting Sparrowhawk. Just bear with me. We've got one more king to get through. <laughs> After James' death in 1625, Charles I assumes the throne and implements higher taxes, right? Rebellions break out in Scotland, Ireland, due to religion. Yeah, he tries to change the, the, the Scottish and Irish prayer book. Not, such, not so popular. England moves towards civil war. Um, reason for that is, is complex, but the short math is there'd been this long standing debate about how a king should live, right? Um, and the conclusion by the people, by parliament, was that a king should live of his own. In other words, rather than taxing the people to death, um, and you know, living a lavish lifestyle where your people are starving, you need to find a way to support your own lifestyle uh, that's not going to, you know, adversely affect your people. And that this also segues into the, this notion of what was the just king. Well, a just king takes care of his people. Okay, so there's two two big buckets there. But anyway, this is why Charles the First lost his head because he didn't like what Parliament was doing. He dissolved Parliament twice. Um, anyway. England moves towards civil war. There's this elemental struggle, um, especially when he was beheaded. How can, how can, you know, the average man, aka Parliament, behead a king who's appointed by God? This is a huge thing for England. Anyway, anyway, we're getting a little bit more uh, off topic. But um, inhabitants, many inhabitants of England, Scotland, Ireland, turn their gaze to America as an alternative. Yeah, things are crazy in England right now. Maybe we should just get out and go to this this, this wonderful place. Uh, out, you know, got across the ocean first, but I hear it's uh, quite, quite an interesting place. And of course, propagandists fueled that idea that it was um, a place to be. Okay, so let's like, let's look at London in the 1620s a little bit. Um, so London was becoming slowly a hub of mercantilism, mercantilism and political power. Uh, drew many working poor, which contributed to plagues. You know, plagues were endemic in London, any large city at this time. Um, and you, know, you can see the uh, it spikes every few years. The, the plagues uh, would pop up. I think there was one in 1625. Uh, anyway, jobs were scarce, didn't pay much. Um, James and Charles inherited lackluster economy that we talked about. They were struggling with this notion, is England really reformed? Because the Reformation was kind of a compromise Protestantism, you know, the Anglican church. Um, many thought, like the separatists, the pilgrims, that England really wasn't fully reformed, that they needed to go to America to build this shining city on a hill and show England how, how it ought to be done right. <laughs> so there was that. I was struggling, you know, I'm not really happy with England. It's not quite fully reformed. There's plagues, poor economy, jobs are few and far between. Um, so the colonies, right, became this land of opportunity. Or was it a dumping ground for excess population? It was kind of both. England had a big movement at this time against vagrancy. In other words, if you didn't have a job, guess what? You'd probably find yourself on a boat to America because they didn't, it was this huge effort to um, rid surplus populations of London that didn't have uh, a meaningful role. Because guess what? These guys just stood around begging for food. They were probably plague ridden, so get them out of here, right? That's kind of what, what, was, what was happening. This is a wonderful map of London at the time showing the various gates and there's the River Thames. Uh, and you can see how, I mean, compared to what London is today, how relatively small it was, okay? Um, so I mentioned propaganda for the colonies. Well, in 1626, actually, yeah, the, the uh, John Smith General History comes out, uh, which I think is a revised, I think there's also one that came out in 1624. But anyway, it featured an idealized, idealized portrait of Virginia. It was a place, quote, lacking industrious people. Okay, he's talking about the native population. So this gives, of course, Englishmen are seen as industrious, industrious people, this whole, um, this whole dichotomy between the savage and the civilized. You see this a lot in period texts, right? The savages, they don't know what they're doing. They need us to come over here and show them how to lead a civilized life. 
You hear this a lot. This is giving England an excuse to come over and, you know, displace the indigenous people and make the world England, okay? Um, so this was an ideological thing. And this general history was, again, a very idealized portrait of what was available to you in America. And there's Elizabeth, James, and Charles, all the all three kings at the top, giving the good housekeeping seal of approval for, for this piece of propaganda. Anyway, I'm being a little sarcastic, but um, this is basically what it was, okay? Um, the prospect of indentured servitude uh, didn't didn't seem too bad after you read general history, especially uh, when compared to the current economic, um, you know, climate in England, given the plagues and everything else. So this was a major impetus for people to come to America, reading this these tracks coming back from America about how wonderful they were. Here's a few quotes: um, you know, propaganda for colonization. Heaven and earth never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitations were it fully manured and inhabited by industrious people. In other words, this place is awesome. Just needs the English to come over and make it a really great place. That, that's, <laughs> that's what they need. They need us. Anyway, and then of course, the better sort used large mantles of deer, the better sort of indigenous peoples, that is. Deer skins, not much differing in fashion from the Irish mantles. You see what he's doing? We colonized, we had these colonies in Ireland. We did it there so we can do it here. Look, they're not much different from the Irish. And we did that. So <laughs> it's just hilarious. Anyway, and of course, God's providence underscores it all. You see by what strange means God hath still delivered it. So that was underscoring a lot. The plagues that wiped out 90% of, of native peoples when uh, the European contact occurred. Um, again, that was providential. That was God's will that did that. Um, it wasn't smallpox or anything, or their inability to have antibodies to that disease. It was God's will. So this undergirded so much of the ideology at the time, okay? So we're getting to the voyage, folks. I know you're starting to yawn a little bit, but um, I wanted to provide you with that context, the propaganda, the climate in London, where many, or, you know, uh, many of the vessels obviously didn't sail from London, but um, the ports in the south coast of England was a direct conduit to uh, populations in London and many of the joint stock uh, merchant coalitions were formed in, in London and then they, they came to the coast to find a ship, a captain, victuals, et cetera. So late fall of 1626, about now, <laughs> a small group of London merchants decided to embark on this voyage to Virginia. And their destination was Jamestown. Just, you know, that, that was the thing. Um, we know it was Jamestown because in the wreck itself, when it was unearthed in 1863, um, there were some remnants of agricultural tools. Um, given the climate for tobacco at this time, um, it was pretty clear that's what they were after. We don't know what from which port they sailed. I, I researched as many port books as I can find. I made two trips to England and did primary research in the Ar National Archives and Kew Gardens and um, the, National Li the British Library too. I did find um, original tracts and land grants to John Sibsey, one of the owners or relatives thereof, uh, John Sibsey. I did find that, but um, there was nothing conclusive to talk, that talked anything about a, a voyage or his dissatisfaction with his land in England. He may have sold his land, I bet he did, to fund this voyage. Um, this was common. If you had some assets, you would sell them, get a lump of cash, hire a boat, captain, crew, victuals, et cetera, and make this voyage. Um, often if you had some money of your own, you know, you could, you, it's a better bargaining position uh, with other people or even the crown. This is a painting in the collection of um, Pilgrim Hall. It's by Wilcox. It shows Dartmouth Harbor. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely painting. That's Mayflower in the center. And to the left of it, um, I don't know if I can, right here, this is a vessel about the size of uh, Sparrowhawk to the left of Mayflower. Uh, you can see it's quite, it's a little bit larger than the artifact um, because vessels of this time were what's called high charge. In other words, they had very high uh, superstructures above the water line, okay? But uh, still a small vessel, okay? And I would, if, you, if you haven't seen that painting, it's wonderful, go, go check it out. Now, who were these people? Yeah, the entire passenger manifest is, is unknown. However, we do know of Captain John Fells, uh, who was apparently the sailing master, Captain John Sibsey and several Irish servants and one Captain Johnson. He was the actual captain of the voyage. I think Fells was a, I had some sea, sea experience, but uh, Johnson was the, uh, was the main captain. And Governor Bradford described these people as a rowdy bunch. 
And so they represented in microcosm the ethnic hierarchies created in Ulster and Munster. Sure, you had the English nobles per se at the top with the Irish under that and Scots too. I think uh, Johnson was a Scot. Um, and this is a painting done by Franz Halls in 1624 called The Laughing Cavalier. Um, this is just the kind of smug uh, hubris you would have found with these people. These people were not faint of heart, right? They were adventurers. They were entrepreneurs. Um, they thought they would get rich. They just had to make this voyage, which um, didn't look too bad after reading John Smith's general history and looking at the maps of the time, which we'll get to in a second. Um, didn't look bad at all. And uh, But still, uh, these guys had that sort of, uh, I won't call it an American spirit, but it was certainly, they had gumption, okay? They really, they really did, you know, to get in that small boat and, you know, uh, hope that luck's on their side and they make the voyage, because many didn't. So, I already alluded to this, why Virginia at this time? So, the Virginia Company had collapsed by 1624. Uh, by this time, tobacco was becoming a lucrative business, right? Uh, that, that's what saved Jamestown. That was the gold that uh, that the English were looking for, tobacco, um, both gold and sugar. Uh, importantly, both are addictive substances. So you basically market security that people will want this stuff because they're addicted to it. Anyway, um, back to the Virginia Company. The governance of Jamestown was assumed by the crown. So this was important because um, Jamestown, Jamestown had a long, hard slog, uh, rife with um, deaths and plague and uh, starvation. It was just, just a, a, a pitiful existence for many years. Um, England kept pumping more supplies and resupplies, uh, trying to keep it going along because they, they, were, they were pretty sure that this gamble, this tobacco gamble would pan out, and it did. Okay, But with 1624, um, the British army comes, okay, which helped quell these protracted disputes with the Powhatan's native, native peoples. Uh, this regional stability made Virginia much more attractive for potential colonists and entrepreneurs. So with, with the soldiers, and they requested about 500 soldiers, fully equipped, fully provisioned, that would do it. That was in the, the writings of the time. We, we need about 500 of them. Um, so this made it more attractive to people back in England. Like, okay, well, we've got the British army there. That's going to take care of the native peoples. Um, supply missions are coming with, with increasing regularity. Um, and of course, land grants were a huge incentive for settling, right? Because you couldn't get a, a piece of land unless you were nobility in England. Um, certainly a working person couldn't. So this, after five years in a, as an indentured servant, you could have a piece of land in this new country. That was very compelling, very compelling uh, for, for people to come over, okay? That's the, on the lower right, that's the Jamestown Fort uh an illustration of it you know yeah so as i mentioned by the early to mid 1620s uh tobacco trade in virginia was becoming very profitable high and it was importantly it was high value low volume commodity it was ideal for shipping right because you could pack a lot of tobacco in a hogshead and it had a lot of value you know you go broke trying to ship cotton from america to england because that's large volume low value you know that doesn't do so well with shipping but these high value Low volume commodities like, um, especially tobacco, I mean, sugar is heavy, so um, less so in terms of uh, uh, getting it over there, but still, um, that was the way to go. Um, yeah, James I disapproved of the use of tobacco, but he's talking on both sides of his mouth because the duties, the du customs duties, and um, all the revenue from much of the tobacco uh, went to reinfuse his crown. He wrote his counterblast of tobacco, which basically condemned the use of tobacco, but he loved the money from it. Okay, so a little bit of a paradox there. Um, and, um, you know, he became eventually the sole distributor of tobacco, or at least much of it, and uh, was marked for his personal use. Well, I doubt he could, in uh, his wildest dreams, smoke that much tobacco coming over, but he loved getting the duties, the customs duties from it, and he, he distributed at his discretion. So, um, very interesting thing. So the voyage itself, like Mayflower, Sparrowhawk was bound for Virginia and blown off course. Um, the passengers crew of the vessel had run out of food, water, beer, burned all extra wood to stay warm, wasn't enough. Captain Johnson was also sick with scurvy, which as you know, is comes with uh, lack of citric acid. Uh, it probably, you know, so, so again, that begs the question, 
you know, the crew was desperate to reach land. They're off the Grand Banks. They were it was middle of winter. Like, let's just make landfall anywhere. We don't care. So um, you have to wonder why did they run out of supplies, right? Um, it's a it's a really important question. This is a little diorama that I made many years ago um, uh, of the. I just couldn't find an image to uh, to uh, illustrate this poor pitiful ship um, in this in this raging sea. So I I made this little diorama. Um, I make ship models on the side. So anyway, minor point. Um, so what was the voyage like? This is William Strachey. Uh, he wrote, wrote extensively about this period and about sea voyages in particular, writing in 1609. It was the reef, re, uh, one of the, the sea venture, the resupply mission to Jamestown. So prayer, wonderful quote, prayers, prayers might well be in the heart and lips, but drowned out, drowned in the outcries of the officers. They are louder than the weather or our office. Nothing heard that could give comfort, nothing seen that might encourage hope. It is impossible for me, had I the voice of Stentor and expression of as many tongues as his throat of voices to express the outcries and miseries, not languishing, but wasting his spirits and are constant to his own principles, but not prevailing. So in all of that old English, but he's basically saying, you have no idea how horrible it is out here. Um, even in spite of your best efforts, your courage, et cetera, it's just not enough. <laughs> it's just not enough. It's just, it's awful. The ships, it's on other subject, the ships of that time were very weak. They worked incredibly. By working, I mean the framing and planking was very porous. It wasn't um, wasn't made like they are today or in the 19th century. Um, so they leaked a lot. Um, rigging snapped. Planks came undone. I mean, it was just they had no idea. And that's a whole other. That was the topic of my thesis: is you know the, the, the construction of the vessels. How how did they build such weak vessels? That's another story. But anyway. Um, there's, you see a lot of this talking about the power of the sea uh, during this time. And Spencer, these last three lines, and great sea puffed up with proud disdain to swell above measure of his guise off as threatening to devour all that power his, that his power despised. In other words, you know, you can't take on the sea and win, okay? This is what he's saying here. Um, and Spencer, importantly, both rationalized and promoted the Tudor claim to a British empire by tracing the line of British kings from Brutus to Elizabeth thus making the Atlantic experience the final inevitable chapter in a succession of progressively imperial events. Now, that's a, that's a mouthful, but he's basically crafting this, this, this ethos, this ideology of um, British imperialism and Britannia rules the waves as this final chapter of this, as he says, progressively uh, succession of progressively imperial events. We, we, we beat the Romans, uh, we beat the Spanish, um, now we're conquering this new world. We're doing this through our vessels and our sea power. Um, so this really did, I mean, for a little island like England, this really did, uh, uh, they, they, everybody bought into this, okay? They really did, and they still do. <laughs> of course, Shakespeare, uh, my favorite quote from The Tempest. You have some other minor quotes, but The Tempest, when the sea is hence, what cares these roars for the name of a king? In other words, the king may have sovereignty and power on the dry land, but out here, he's powerless. So this was a kind of a neat thing. Um, actually, the captains became the agents of power on the high seas because they knew how to sail ships. They knew how to get from one side to another. So they had tremendous power. And actually, in Atlantic experience, sea captains um, were much elevated in status. England's all about hierarchical so, uh, social stratification. So sea captains became much more um, elevated as a result of the Atlantic experience, okay? All right, lost at sea just off the Grand Banks. Yeah, that was their, that was their plight. They were just, um, it was a horrible thing. They were, they were desperate to reach shore. And so finally they see breaking surf. It's good old Cape Cod. <laughs> she anchors just offshore, but uh, due to the ferocious storm, her anchor cable parted. So she's blown through the cut. Uh, basically that cut is, well, when I, when I left Cape Cod, the cut was still there. I, I took a picture of it right there. Um, that's North Chatham or South Orleans. People debate, people claim, uh, Chatham, Chathamites claim that Sparrowhawk uh, wrecked in Chatham and people in Orleans claim the same because it's kind of right on the line. But um, anyway, she passes through the cut, came ashore uh, in this area. I think it's uh, Pleasant Bay and um, just south of Strong Island. So, um, and that's where she reemerged in 1863. Anyway, um, 
So again, why did, why did this happen, right? Why did this happen? Did the organizers of Sparrowhawk fail to plan or plan to fail? Well, what I mean by plan to fail is the information they had wasn't the best, okay? Uh, again, there's John Smith, his map of New England. Um, the maps of the Atlantic, you can see here on the uh, upper right, the Atlantic looks not too big uh, compared to what it is now. Uh, maps of the day were skewed uh, towards pro-colonization, made it look not too bad, not too bad. You see ships all over the place about to make landfall. Um, there's uh, uh, Cape Ann and uh, I think this is Cape Cod down here in the lower right here, Cape Cod, Cape Ann, so Gloucester. Anyway, um, ships about making sure here's a bunch of ships at sea. Uh, there's an occasional sea monster. <laughs> and there's the English seal at the top. We've made this New England. It is now ours because we call it that. <laughs> so um, what happens? They're wrecked, they're cold, they're miserable, they're hungry. Governor Bradford tried to help these people repair their vessel, but they wrecked it a second time. Yeah, he lent them some spikes and oakum to a, pl a plank had sprung loose and caused a, caused a great leak. Um, they tried to repair it, but uh, they ground it up again. And that was it, the, the vessel was toast. Uh, they were brought up to Plymouth Plantation and incorporated there temporarily. They're given some land to work. So they didn't really mix with the pilgrims that well. John Fells uh, yeah, wanted a girlfriend and got one. He was accused of um, ungentlemanly behavior towards one of the servant girls. And when he denied it, he denied it, but then she began to show she was pregnant and Jig was up for him. Uh, so the question, of course, were they really a rowdy bunch or were the pilgrims an uptight bunch? Probably a bit of both. Um, in any event, Bradford tells him to basically get lost the summer of 1627. He goes, you guys, you're just not fitting in well up here, okay? So you wanted to go to Jamestown, why don't you take a boat down the coast and go to Jamestown? And that's what they, that's what they did. Uh, we know for a fact that John Sibsey, there's records down there, they became, I think, one of the House of Burgesses and uh, actually built the first church down there. Um, there's good evidence on his uh, arrival in, in Virginia. So uh, he wasn't as rowdy as, <laughs> when he was born in the first church, became an upstanding uh, leader in the community and uh, a wealthy man. He had a huge plantation, um, uh, wealthy man. So he got his American dream, let's very cautiously call it that, but, uh, or, or English dream at the time. So <clears throat> I better step it up, we're running out of time. The only other accounts of the wreck uh, from the early 17th century from Morton and Prince, who basically copied, copied Bradford's account. Brad, Bradford's account is probably the best one. Um, Morton did give us the note that, um, like uh, captain of the ship was Johnston. Um, then gradually, Sparrowhawk gradually disappeared as shifting sands of Cape Cod slowly covered her over. However, her location was given the name of Old Ship Harbor. There's still an Old Ship Harbor lane, I believe in Orleans, um, and she would not reappear till 1863. So um, jumping fast forward to 1863, uh, Basically, Cape Cod revealed the remains of the ship between the 4th and 6th of May in 1863. And this was chronicled by Amos Otis. His description, yeah, provides some of those interesting insights into the appearance of the vessel. This is a drawing that he did. He was very meticulous in his notes. And it's a wonderful track, um, that, uh, that description. And I think it's available online now. Anyway, he talks about a lot of things. And this drawing is very compelling because <clears throat> it shows 53 futtocks, which are these little timbers here. I hope you can see my cursor. And one of the most important clues for me anyway was the um, location of the mast step, which is directly amidships, okay? Many people thought she was catch rigged, um, which would have been indicative of a smaller vessel, but the placement of the mast step, if this is correct, uh, would support she was more ship rigged, which um, there were many small ships in this period, okay? So, um, during this time, uh, we're in the middle of a civil war. In 1865, Leander Crosby and Charles Linnell paid to have the artifact excavated and moved to Boston Common. Accounts of the day refer to it as a great curiosity. Now, this is one of my favorite photographs. I believe that's um, Leander Crosby at the stern post, and there's Sparrowhawk, much as she is today, very, very, I mean, almost to the T. Here's the, the shadow of the photographer, which is just wonderful. He's got his tripod set up and his camera. 
And here's a policeman who was told, you know, it's okay if people break pieces off, just don't, don't let them burn it or do something crazy um, to it. And this was what people did. They, this was before we, um, we took antiquities like this or artifacts like this as national treasures. They were seen as, as kind of like a, a circus show, a circus freak. And people um, broke pieces off and took them home as souvenirs, things like that. Um, it was perfectly acceptable at the time. Um, and there's, here's a ticket, <clears throat> Pilgrim ship, Sparrowhawk in mid one. Now, why do you suppose uh, they put, they put Sparrowhawk on Boston Common at this time? Um, I'll, I'll, well, I'll tell you. So America was being torn apart by civil war, North and South, and this humble little artifact reminded everybody that we were once one people, North and South, um, with a unified vision, a unified purpose. So it's kind of a, I won't say a healing thing, but a reminder that, um, you know, we're one people after all, at the end of the day, uh, we're all Americans, we're all, you know, in the same, same geographic scope. Um, so that's kind of an interesting uh, sidelight to that. So interpreting the artifact, um, probably the most fun part and also the most difficult part. So Hobart Holly was one of was a yacht, or I'm sorry, a merchant ship designer, early 20th century. He took a stab at uh, a his his view of what the vessel looked like. Now he was a merchant ship designer, so that sensibility is apparent in his drawing here. The midship section he drew is very much like an early 20th century merchant ship. Okay, um, and this. Uh, yeah, this profile is, is, is really ridiculous when you compare it to uh, period illustrations, engravings, and, and tracks, which is what I attempted to do. What, what is nice about it is he does show in the, in the dark gray portion or this medium gray, the artifact relative to his reconstruction, okay? So you can see what's actually there and what he added, which is important. Now look at this in the middle of the page. This is um, a midship section taken from uh, tracks and tables of the early 17th century, which is much more accurate. This is much more what she, her section would have looked like, very different from this, okay? All right. So let's give a look at a few 17th century merchant vessels. So um, yeah, vessels of the time were tubby, rose high over the water, they were high charged, that's what that's called. Uh, this is a contradiction to the, uh, many of the postulates of Baker, Holly and Lawler, you know, two other people that sort of speculated about Sparrowhawk. Um, also artwork of the time by many different artists corroborates this assumption. Now you can say artists took liberties with their drawings, many did, but guess what? Um, several artists all drew ships the same way. So why do you suppose that is? Maybe there's some truth to it. Um, you know, many of these like this lower right-hand corner, this is a small ship uh, similar to what Sparrowhawk would have looked like, I believe anyway. Um, this one in the middle is a little bit too large. Uh, it's a soaring stern castle, but they did have these huge superstructures of the time. Look at the Vasa, okay? Um, she was sank in 1628, so one year later, um, and she was um, very unstable. Um, people didn't understand at this time uh, center of gravity very well. Uh, these ships were high charged as imposing symbols of state power and pride, but these didn't do well in the Atlantic. Um, many of these vessels, um, like the Mary Rose, for example, she was also uh, unstable and capsized right in front of Henry VIII offshore. Um, we're lucky that they did capsize because we have a wonderful time capsule to study um, these vessels and period methodology in terms of naval architecture, ornament, what was found on board, all the material culture. So, um, but she's high charge too, right? Um, supporting uh, this idea that these vessels were rose high out of the water. So of course there's 16th and 17th century um, naval architecture treatises. Probably the most uh, germane one that I used was um, Matthew Baker's Fragments of Ancient Shipwrightry, which uh, is basically, Baker's taking credit for a lot of different people like John Hawkins and Martin Frobisher and Sir Walter Raleigh. They all had ideas uh, about how a ship should be built and put together and what proportions, but um, Matthew Baker did kind of a one-stop shopping and sort of amalgamated all of these different ideas into one tract. So that's 
very helpful. And he has a lot of very wonderful illustrations if you've ever seen uh, excerpts from uh, ancient shipwright tree. He's got um, a profile of a ship with a large fish superimposed over it. If you Google it, you, you'll, you'll see it in a minute. Um, likening the underwater body to that of a fish, because if it works for a fish, it should work for a boat. <laughs> anyway, um, these texts pro <laughs> provide an insight in design and construction of vessels. They do. Um, what's also important to know is that uh, included in these tracks are tables that anybody could build a boat if they had if they had lumber. So it was very much codified and laid out for you, uh, certain width, certain height, certain depth, certain length. Um, you would get a certain size vessel that would work, that wouldn't tip over, okay? Here's Baker's, um, it's a wonderful drawing, uh, showing his principles in full force. I won't go in, I don't wanna get too much into the technical stuff, but rising and narrowing lines, which are these and these, uh, and this very formulaic approach to the um, frames of the vessel, um, making them lay in exactly in the right spot, nice and fair from um, stem to stern, okay? And most of this is based on either straight lines and ar or arcs of a compass. You see these compass points, this radius, this sweep was your stem. Um, these midship sections were all put together with grid systems and uh, plotted points of compass arcs, okay? They were called compass timbers for that reason, okay? So I took a stab using those tables and the um, extant portion of Sparrowhawk, her, I, I, I laid out a frame on the floor and described a compass arc. I took a batten and fixed it at a point and um, another basically swung it down till it matched the arc of Sparrowhawk's actual timber. I was able to get many of these lower arcs here, okay? From that, I could reverse engineer the midship section, which is here, okay? Again, using Baker's formula. These were all very spelled out for people. They were cut and dried, right? Yeah. That's all you had to do to build a ship and space them so far apart, okay? So based on that, I came up with this reconstruction. Um, and that would be an, that's an illustration I did. What I think she would have looked like uh, in the original portion would have been the artifact is down here, like right in there, right in there. Okay, uh, shows a shipwreck vessel with the mast where Otis documented it, and then a very small formist bowsprit and mizzen to balance the rig. Okay, anyway, that's my stab at it. So, Pilgrim Hall, that's where Sparrow Hawk is now, guys. So, um, impress upon them the need to display and interpret her because <laughs> she's in storage right now. Sparrow Hawk has been housed. In the Pilgrim Hall Museum from 1889, well, to the present, when I made this presentation, I guess it was in 2007, um, but uh, she's still there. I mean, I brought her down, Stephen and I brought her down, Stephen O'Neill, I brought her down to uh, Cape Cod Maritime Museum when I was there, and you see in this lower picture, we that's the keel, what's left of it, and this cradle here, which is so important because it references each futtock, uh to where they should be. We marked with tape, on the uh, frames uh, where they each went. They were, it was bolted together, but here are the timbers on the floor laid off and marked, uh, ready for transport and reassembly. And here it is on the right in the basement of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum and being reinstalled in the main exhibit gallery on the left. And this was great fun. I had Stephen down. We spent days uh, reassembling her carefully in her cradle uh, on her new site. And it was just wonderful to display her prominently. Um, yeah, finally back on Cape Cod where she belongs. Um, so that was a very satisfying moment for me personally to bring her down and show her off to the public. And she always, people, kids especially, uh, you know, looking at this thing, they're like, it's like a dinosaur. They're just fascinated by it. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Um, and you can see based on the arc of this circle here, how much of the vessel is missing, right? I mean, if you were to extend that arc up, and further, you'd have the vessel, yeah, up, up here, basically, the shear would be up here. Um, so there she is, almost done on display, showing the voyage across uh, the pond, so-called, um, on the wall there. So what is the significance of this artifact? These are a few things. Uh, there's probably more, um, you know, 
much uh, historiography has been written about the Plymouth colony, the paradigm of a pious and diversified economy in the North, Jamestown colony emblematic of corrupt slave ridden monoculture in the South, AKA tobacco. Uh, for a time it was polarized, um, much more historiography of the early to mid 20th century. Um, not so much now, there's been a lot of correctives written about um, the fact that uh, there was, you know, uh, plenty of religious people down south and some corruption up north as well. So um, people are people. Um, Passenger Sparrowhawk represent a hybridization of both cultures, um, which does reinsert a level of subtlety and complexity in how we view the Great, great Migration, right? Um, yeah, we talked about um, religious freedom as, a, as an option for America, but also making money. So that kind of fueled the two pots. You know, the North was about the shining city on the hill and um, all of that. And then the South was about making money. So it's too simple to be true because there were there are aspects uh, to both in, in both regions. Um, yeah, people may have not been necessarily pious, but of a robust and rowdy nature. Sensibility resonates with Americans in past and present. It does. American spirit, cowboys, soldiers, all of that, that never say die, uh, always something better out West sort of mentality. As people are emblematic of that. So that alone makes the Sparrowhawk something that uh, ought to be preserved and interpreted and celebrated, I think. Um, so uh, go down, bang on the door of Pilgrim Hall and, <laughs> and tell, tell them to get an exhibit together with this vessel because it's just too cool. Um, all right, well, we're about, we have a few minutes for questions, I think. Um, if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to uh, try and answer them. We do indeed, Mark. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, and they've come in sort of during the program. First of all, I want to tell you, you have uh, people attending, uh, several people from out west. Um, oh. They got up early and maybe they're enjoying this over a cup of coffee. But one has joined from England. Oh, so, very good. Yes, very good. You're, you're really um, going all around there. So well, I, I would say... Let's see, one of the first questions would be um, actually to comment, if you would, on, you know, the recent um, report from the Journal, Journal of Archaeological Science about the dating of those, um, the frame. Well, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. I haven't seen that yet. Okay, so coming out, I think, soon. Um, so one of the questions from Alan is the Wyman, Alan Wyman. If I have that right, Alan, were other European countries engaged in privateering or privacy at this time? Uh, piracy? Uh, piracy. Piracy, sure. Yes. Or you had, yeah, absolutely. You had um, uh, French, Portuguese privateers. Yeah, it was, sure. It was, um, you know, England wasn't the only one that was, um, you know, attacking ships. But again, the English ambitions uh, were more transatlantic. And many, many state uh, attacked uh, vessels close to the coast, especially in the Mediterranean, the Corsairs and Algiers and whatnot. Um, you had a lot of Mediterranean piracy, you always have, always, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there were other other countries, sure, because it's easy money. As soon as you're a few miles offshore, it's, it's the Wild West. So, yep. Um, another question coming in from Viola. Boston on the historical land of the Massachusetts. Um, so with a goal of becoming Virginia planters theologically, would the ship passengers be classified as strangers? Hmm. Um, Church of England, non-Puritans, a Catholic hmm. or two. Hmm. And, you know, would that have helped fuel a clash with Bradford? Could be, absolutely. Yeah, you know, you know we, we all know how that goes uh, with regards to religions, you know. <laughs> We think ours is wonderful and others not so much. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, plus their behavior didn't help them any. <laughs> um, and you know, in your research, especially back in the archives in England, I mean, did the sea captains who did these journeys write about you know the realities yes. of crossing the Atlantic given absolutely. the information they had? Absolutely, yeah. You you have um, there's all kinds of wonderful tracks out there. The William Strachey that I mentioned, that that one excerpt, he's written many, 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 many tracks about the voyages and how miserable they were. Um, Sir Walter Raleigh wrote about it. He had very, very, very strong opinions about 
His Majesty's ships and how they need to be modified to better handle the Atlantic seas. And these, these giant, like the Vasa, these giant state ships were just, they're, they're not, they might be fine in the channel close to home, but you get them out in the Atlantic and they fall apart or capsize or, come, you know, just a mess. And he had very, very pointed views about how these ships should be modified to be better, more sea kindly uh, and make the voyages better and less people die, basically. So. Yeah, because I mean, those sea captains were really, you know, responsible for their safety. So you yes. would think that they're, yes. yeah, they would really want to know what they were getting well, themselves plus, in. Plus, the, you know, they were doing England a service by helping them to make better ships because you have more transatlantic commerce, you have more people going over to, to fuel the economies, uh, colonies, excuse me, and uh, it's just in everyone's best interest. So many of them, they were listened to, they were listened to and implemented. Uh, by the shipwrights, for sure. Yeah. So, and I, I know you covered this briefly, but again, just to reiterate, there were no plans that you found that were used to construct the Sparrowhawk. No, nope. no plans. The closest I could find was a set of uh, uh, tables that um, Strachey, when he was, when he, the third resupply mission, when he wrecked the Sea Venture, they built two pinnaces. And he talks about doing that in a matter of uh, weeks or months. So these were built really quickly. And he has a table that he laid out, basic, basic proportions that they built these vessels to. So um, that was also helpful in my uh, sort of synthesized hypothesis of what Sparrowhawk looked like. Yeah. So Catherine has a very uh, good question about the ship. Um, the structure of the ship. Mm -hmm. And her question is, are there reports of how much higher the sides came up or other features of the ship when it was first exposed yes. in 1863? Yes. So Otis talks about, and I, sh I should insert more of his stuff because he gives wonderful descriptions about the vessel and how finely fitted the timbers were, the, the planking, um, all of that, and how people were taking pieces off on a daily basis. Once she reappeared, people were pulling pieces off and taking them off in carts. Uh, you, you can only wonder, uh, had they not done that, how much more of an artifact we would have had to study and uh, corroborate a lot of our assumptions um, had that not happened. But it was just, that was the overarching thing is that the, the ship was amazingly well put together. Um, I can go into very technical details about, about all of that, but, um, I don't know if we have some shipbuilders out there, but uh, the frames were um, what's called floating frame system. In other words, they were not contiguous to one another. They kind of floated, which means when they plank the vessel, all the stresses when the vessel loads up in a seaway, uh, it's not uh, transferred to the frames, to the keel, through the planking at all. It's very porous. It works, it works tremendously because they didn't figure out that they needed to join the frames to one another double sawn construction, which Mayflower 2 was built that way, and all the other replica ships are built that way. Uh, it's a very weak structure, okay? So they inherited that from uh, the Venetians, and that's and that was the subject of my thesis, is Henry VIII imported Italian shipwrights to build his navy in the early 16th century, and in so doing, he imported the fatal flaw, which is the galley construction. Anyway, I'm getting way off topic, but um, <laughs> anyway, I hope that... <laughs> sort of answered your question. I don't know. So another question though, from one of our Duxbury friends, Peter, was John Smith the main authority on navigation and map making during the early 17th century? Um, any feedback from Mayflower crew to backers of the Sparrowhawk or any know. lessons learned? I, that, I don't know about, I don't know about, about uh, the Mayflower Sparrowhawk connection at all because it just isn't much document documentation. I mean, Mayflower, if you try to find Mayflower in the port books, you'll find about five different Mayflowers, right? Mm -hmm. So they're spelled in all different ways and um, different tonnages. Um, Sparrowhawk, there's, again, we don't even know if that's her name because uh, there's some evidence to suggest that her name was the Hawk and she was found on Mr. Sparrow's property, hence the term, the hyphenated term Sparrowhawk. So I looked, I tried to find, there were some Sparrowhawks uh, in the port books, but none, none of the target tonnage that, that we were after. So again, it remains a sort of enigmatic and a, and a mystery. Um, 
to try to nail it down in terms of a name or any of that, or even the people on board. So uh, yeah, it's just the best guess. Um, what was the other part of the question? The map um, making, the map making. John Smith, yeah, he yeah. was, he was, yeah, he was, he was the main guy on uh, in terms of what we have today. There were other minor people that that tried to make maps, but his general history and his maps of of this region were the ones that were widely printed and distributed in London and England. Um, is kind of the the gold standard for what it looked like over here. Sure, and they were tool. But believe you me, they were tool. What I call tools of empire. Um, they were because they. The way these maps were made and crafted and the iconography used made it seem like there's all of, you know, just look at the landforms. You see uh, they're, they're teeming with game, the, the, the oceans are teeming with fish. There's lots of trees, all of these commodities, right? Commodities that you can go over and, and, and sell and this whole commodification of natural resources begins with those maps uh, and the English sort of mentality about uh, these commodities we need to sell. Um, so very different from native peoples or indigenous peoples um, ideologies uh, about the land. So uh, anyway, I'm sure there's more questions. <laughs> so just as there, you know, is that wonderful um, Elizabeth Tilly that's, you know, that is enjoyed so much up and down in this area. I think um, you have comments that there's a hope to recreate the Sparrowhawk as a sailing ship, except we won't sail it to the south side of the Cape in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was actually a, a pet project of mine when I was at the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. After after we built Sarah, I was like, well, let's build a replica of Sparrowhawk, you know, as a iconic ship to have uh, in Hyannis Harbor. And everybody liked that idea. Um, so I would love to see that happen. I would, you know, I'm also the uh, a maritime history curator. I'm also the, the museum boat boat ride down here. So we're building boats. Uh, I'll continue to do that here, uh, building several boats right now. But um, I would love to be involved. If somebody has the gumption and the will to build a replica of Sparrowhawk, I would love to be involved with that. <laughs> Mark, could you just touch briefly on what you did with the cat boat, Sarah? Because I built it. it's very inspiring. I built yeah, it. And what what it does well and what it, it was in, it did. So it was a wonderful project that basically I like to say that we started off to build a cat boat, but in the end we built a museum because we did. Mm -hmm. We started building that. I was hired, I think it was in 2004 to be the, the boat builder to, to um, build Sarah. And we started off in the old anchor outboard, which wasn't a museum at all. It was just an empty shell. We set up a shop in one end and started building Sarah. By and by we, we got money, I guess, from two back-to-back -back IMLS grants to uh, to do this project, and we built an office. Uh, we had an administrator at the time. Sarah was growing in the shop. Kids were coming down. Community members were coming down, seeing this thing uh, growing in the shop, and uh, people were just captivated by it. Uh, then we built an exhibit space, um, all of that, and turned into a museum in the end. And Sarah was, I think, launched in 2007 and became a floating classroom, which I think she continues as this uh, to this day. And it's just a wonderful program. I would, anybody that has uh, a museum near water, um, it's a wonderful thing to have those boats for people to go out on and experience, make a connection with the water. It's just a wonderful thing. So um, anyway. Um, so on that note, Mark, I think we should probably bring this to a, a close. One of your <laughs> listeners, though, and um, Laura commented that, um, you know, if she's wondering if you know John Daly and Peter, and I'm going to tell her yes. <laughs> and if they're watching, um, and maybe this will help inspire all our wonderful pilgrim enthusiasts who are sharing this today. And thank you again for your knowledge and just helping um, bring to life this wonderful little piece of history. And um, we will um, look forward to seeing what you do next and the next chapter for the Sparrowhawk. Thank, well, you thank you so much, you. Mark. And thank again, you. thanks to Mass Humanities for sponsoring this program. Please go to their website. They have fabulous newsletters about the various projects that they are doing to engage Massachusetts. Um, culture and humanity. So thank you again so much. Thank you. All right, you all. Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay. Yep.
Take Bye-bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye.